Okay, but you know, of course, COVID nineteen has had huge impact on many industries and, and many uh, mindset in in um, in executives, and this is why we'll have a. Uh, uh, Talia talking uh, about a perfect storm. COVID-19 pandemic puts API at the forefront of digital transformation. Hello, Talia. How are you? I am great. Thanks, Mehdi, for that introduction. Yeah, thank you very much. I invite you to share your slides with us Okay. and put them full screen. And I think we're close to, yeah, that's it. That's perfect. The stage is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you for being there with us. Thanks so much. Uh, so today I wanted to talk about the impact of COVID-19 and how the in banking and financial market, markets, the technology mix has changed. Also talking about some regulations such as PS2 directives and how that's changed the market, including fintechs and the compet co competitive situations. And most importantly, I want to talk about architectures and patterns that, su that support APIs and some of these integration architectures. For many organizations, COVID-19 has presented many, ch many, many challenges, but with challenges come opportunities. In As we look at various industries, we've seen that te tech savvy organizations are outperforming their peers during the pandemic. In banking and financial markets, uh, they widely adopted uh, there at 5%, whereas in retail, the tech savvy ones have way outperformed them by 16%. Uh, with this, 60% of executives are accelerating their organization's digital transformation through the pandemic. And two thirds of these executives said the pandemic has allowed them to focus on these um, specific transformations and projects that previously maybe they faced resistance or they didn't have the budget, but uh, now they needed to transform digitally to, to meet the challenge. When we look at the mix of technologies and, and what has changed during the pandemic, we've seen looking at top companies that the top three focus areas are mobile, artificial intelligence and cloud computing. Those have had the greatest performance in, impact in within industry. With mobile moving to the top, this brings APIs at the forefront of uh, digital transformation. Cloud and AI are also becoming differentiators while hybrid cloud and the enabling cloud technologies also help that performance. When we take a look at the banking and financial markets view, um, or the IBM Institute of Business Value, what they saw was that within the pandemic, uh, in the first few months of the lockdown, they saw a 30 to 40% increase in mobile and web volumes, a 300 and 400% increase in call center volumes. And as I in the previous chart, we saw that mobile is now an essential. It's not a differentiator or an opportunity. It's an essential technology that all organizations need to implement. And not only this, this these digital transformation is here to stay. And uh, 30 to 40 percent of institutions saw that um, their web volumes increased by 30 to 40% and their 300 to 400% increase in call center volumes. And not only that, these, these changes and digital activities are here to stay. That's according to a recent uh, BAI study that um, saw that these organizations, 90% of them were gonna keep these digital uh, usage. I mentioned the PSD, to directive. This was implemented by the European um, European Union. And some of the objectives of the PSD2 were to increase, uh, make it a more integrated and efficient payments market. And it also wanted to level the playing field so that not only financial institutions, but uh, newcomers such as fintechs 
uh, could uh, start to innovate and provide services. And also, of course, they wanted to make it more safe and secure um, and increase the protections for not only for consumers, but businesses. This leads us to the open banking and the imperatives that are faced by financial institutions, fintechs, and others as they implement these directives, such as PSD, PSD2. Uh, a lot of them are, are caused by, by regulation, and so that that innovation is driven by the pressures from both uh, customers and regulators. Uh, now, customers expect the same level of service. They expect their institutions to allow them to use a mint or others uh, to aggregate their data, for example. And uh, these are creating some uh, differentiators for in institutions as we see more revenue per customer is captured when uh, they're able to meet the, their customers' demands. Uh, I spoke about innovation and what this does is drives business agility and innovation within the market. And also these, these uh, transactions now can be regulated and be compliant. And at the, core front, at the forefront of these um, foundational attributes of open banking, we see many things. Uh, open architectures, cloud enables, they need to be scalable. But of course, we have to have pervasive AI. And we to do all of this, APIs are at the forefront of these open architecture, modular, and interoperable. Just to give you a timeline of how integration and application technology trends have transitioned over time, and I'm not going to read all of these. But, you know, we went all the way from green screens and let's move quite forward to single page web applications with the with the Internet. And all of a sudden we started having enterprise application integration, which that's where I started my career. And, uh, you know, having hub and spoke architectures to we moved to from an integration perspective to service oriented architecture. All of a sudden with cloud, now we're talking about containers, cloud native and microservices, functions as a service. And all of this now leads us uh, from an integration perspective that now we need to be API led integration and we need to have an agile integration architecture. I talked about not just the architectures, but what are the patterns that enable these integration architectures? Uh, Kyle Brown, an IBM fellow, and, uh, and other colleagues and collaborators have come up with some patterns, cloud adoption patterns. And as you can tell, you know, cloud adoption, you know, it often leads to microservices. And I'm not going to go through all the dependencies here, but you know, uh, microservices are often based on event-based architecture. And as we try to modernize, and perhaps we have mainframe or others, we need to have some coexistent patterns as we're trying to modernize these applications. And you know, microservices, of course, are designed and deployed using cloud-native architecture for. Very much more details on all of these architectures, you can look at the link before on these cloud adoption patterns. They're very detailed um, patterns and how to adopt them and, and how to use them. Now, in terms of APIs, when we think about these microservices applications and we have RESTful where you need a, an application, you need to get someone's uh, username or bank account, perhaps you're going to use a REST API and you're going to implement that in a very much um, synchronous fashion. But then you also need some other services that are more asynchronous. Then you need some event streams for that. And But to the Im implement these microservices, you really need them for them to be independent and decoupled because you need agility you need scalability and you need resilience. Uh, from an agility perspective, 
you need to innovate rapidly. Each team can be uh, working on their parts uh, as part of a DevOps, uh, Dev DevOps development cycle. And not only that, you need to scale rapidly and, and securely. And uh, let's say Black Friday or COVID, you need to have these microservices that can scale. And they also need to be resilient. When we look at cloud application integration, we have a modern integration architecture. This example is of a major bank uh, that completed a successful digital transformation. Number one, the bank started out in phase one where they were just trying to look at mobile applications and some analytics based on these applications and to reach their customers through new channels. And that, that was successful. In a second phase now, they wanted to have real-time transactions and access to backend data. Perhaps it was in their mainframe and having a more digital experience uh, without compromising control and governance. The solution that the bank adopted was to adopt an integration platform that had cloud characteristics for scalability. I mentioned that earlier, and it needed to have performance and agility. Now, when we look at this integration architecture, if you look in the box here in the public cloud network, we see the integration capabilities. We need to have API management. We need to have application data integration. We need to have enterprise messaging. I also spoke about event streaming and high-speed high, high, high transfer. I mentioned how my background was in, in SOA. And as we see how organizations need to evolve from that those SOA architectures and now to be API phase. At IBM, we have many customers that are using mainframes today. And their form of connectivity was they if currently if they were using a cloud native or developing a cloud native application, of course, they could use an API gateway and then have some transformation and connectivity. And typically, uh, you use a message queue that's a old SOA-based integration pattern, and maybe you're accessing a Kix transaction. And that was the, I, I want to say, the old way of doing things. But now with an API-based economy, uh, you know, as we saw with social security and other changes that, that came in during COVID, organizations needed to adapt and change their code uh, much quicker. And from a main, mainframe perspective, instead, as we lose some of the uh, skills in uh, COBOL and others, and uh, now we want to enable and uh, exposed to our cloud native applications, these mainframe applications. So now we have technologies such as our ZOS Connect that can take these Kix application, COBOLs, or DB2 or other, and expose them so that they can be invoked from a cloud native way without necessarily having to rewrite these applications. And now letting young developers be able to develop these cloud native ac applications from the mainframe. I spoke about event driven architectures, which are becoming very prop popular today. Uh, what we're seeing with these is that with the commoditization of um, of compute power and being able to spin up and spin down uh, these servers uh, and infrastructure becoming a commodity, now we see the need to implement these type of event-driven reference architectures. Uh, so now a uh, typical event would come in and you need to, um, these events, there might be many applications that are interested in these events, but you don't need to, you don't need to know which applications uh, are interested in this event. You're just surfacing these events uh, to applications that maybe are sub subscribed to these events, and you don't care how they implement or what they do, what they implement. 
Um, and so you can use these functions as a service that are available in many cloud providers uh, to, to implement these event-based driven reference architectures. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Talia. Uh, so we have a, a first question. Uh, would you consider that the main uh, actor of digital transformation is not the CIO, is not the CTO, it was the COVID-19? Yeah, so I think it's both uh, top down and bottom and bottoms up, right? Developers and DevOps teams are implementing these new services and so they maybe always wanted to uh, work on these initiatives, uh, but maybe didn't have the top-down approval. So now CIOs needed to uh, look at it as an opportunity to reinvent. For example, from our own customers, we had Delta and others that took, took it as an opportunity. They were very hit with COVID and took it as an opportunity to reinvent themselves and implement some of these, not only uh, architectures, but also going cloud first and cloud native. Would you say that it was for the first time that business funded enough the IT department to do a, a good digital transformation? Yeah, I think it became essential, right? Uh, businesses, it was an imperative. It was, they needed to meet their customers where they were. Banks were closed down, right? They couldn't go into um, to the offices or bank branches. All of a sudden, they needed to allow customers to reach bank services, and that drove mobile adoption. We saw that 30 to 40 percent uh, increase during COVID. So, absolutely. Uh, would you would you say that uh, APIs, microservices, event driven architecture, is first a mindset? or is just a set of technology uh, that, that you can implement to everything? Or is there any cultural aspect about understanding this, this technology? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say, as with anything, that um, you know, the architectures and patterns, uh, we all, always need to use them judiciously. We need to do a fit for purpose. And I think that's why those cloud adoption patterns that I spoke about from Kyle Brown and others, uh, those are really, um, I would say, foundational patterns as we try to um, you know, implement and choose judiciously which ones to implement. Um, you know, it's not the same fit for everything. So uh, let's hope it will not be the case, but let's say uh, uh, something like, uh, 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 some uh, kind of events like that highly perturbed the whole world may happen in the future. Uh, to your mind and according to your research and at, at your knowledge, how many, what percentage of company could be ready, you know, to uh, uh, to face like such uh, challenges that we have faced already? Hmm. Well, I I, I think uh, COVID presented quote unquote as we call it in technology, like a proof of concept for us and how ready organizations were ready to adapt. I think it exposed many organizations and I think there are many lessons learned for them. Uh, we talk about hospitals and now they're, uh, you know, similar to technology companies, they're trying to spin up and down hospital rooms on demand as they see spikes in uh, COVID-19. I just heard that story on, um, uh, on the radio the other day. So I think similarly, it's not just about technology companies, but this is happening, uh, you know, I would say across all industries, in particular, those hit by COVID-19. Yeah, I think- we have a I think organizations will become more resilient over time and be able to adapt quick, more quickly to these challenges because of COVID. So we have a question uh, about, um, uh, let, let me let me read it. Um, uh, yeah, most of the consulting companies have been advocating for adapting to change or adapting to new technologies. Isn't, isn't a, a question of adopting them more than just adapting to them? 
Oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. It's, um, you know, it's adoption without a need there, there, uh, you need to have a reason to adopt. And, uh, the more important thing is being able to be adaptable, right. And to figure out the right architecture and the right pattern. And, uh, that's, that's what's going to make a difference. Uh, a question about regulations. How today a bank can apply PSD2 like regulations obliging to open APIs in the same time than GDPR or CCPA privacy regulation that oblige like to secure uh, data and, and keep privacy private? Yeah, at the core front of PSD2 and others is, um, you know, the first of all that consumers grant access uh, and in a granular fashion to what uh, fintech or other applications they want to give. But with GDPR, also remove consent, you know, at, based on the, their need or their decision and when it makes sense to them. So, yes, that's a, at the forefront, at the forefront. Do you see, uh, so a uh, question, do you see a merge between uh, API management solutions, API security solutions, and compliance and data governance solution in the future? That That's a really good question. Um, I, I think uh, maybe there isn't a convergence, but what we'll see is that all these all products and service will in fact have to deal with all of these components and will need to implement this in some fashion. Uh, I would say that um, the ones that do these more holistically and that their set of products can maybe implement something holistically that all products then uh, assume and adopt, I think those companies are the ones that perhaps are going to be more successful instead of it just being a piecemeal and just one product doing and implementing these security and other restrictions. Yeah, so we have another question. Did you see as much digital transformation in governments and public sector during COVID as, as much as the industry? Yeah, um, I... I don't remember the chart off the top of my head, but if we take a look at this chart in terms of, um, I actually don't see public sector here, but anecdotally, I would say that we've seen changes within public sector. Uh, for example, uh, social security, a lot of the services they offered, for example, weren't digital. And now they've had to adapt to change and a lot of, they've now made changes and they have gone more digital over time and more of their services are being offered, um, you know, digitally and uh, they'll remain digital while others, they still see a need, for example, for underrepresented communities or communities that have difficulty accessing um Maybe they don't have internet access or a good computer to access these services. They'll still remain the need to have a uh, social security offices or others for these um, communities that have access challenge. And, and so I see a um, hybrid model where we have digital and as well as remaining um, branches similar to banks, you know, that the banks are open while they have made more digital and mobile capabilities available. Yeah, thank you. And we reached the time. We had uh, some good questions. Thank you very much, Talia, for being with thank us. Thank you. And thank you for sharing such uh, great research.